Hello, hello, beautiful people out there in uh, cyberspace. Uh, my name is Timothy Craig. Uh, welcome to BRTW's Melanated Mondays. Uh, this month uh, has everything to do with uh, housing justice. Uh, I want to thank all of you guys for being here. Uh, we really, really appreciate your time. Every month, uh, we come to you with a new uh, theme related to something that needs to be talked about in our community uh, detrimentally. Um, uh, along with some great writers and some great performers, uh, some great actors, uh, and some great technical crew uh, on the other end. Uh, again, we want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, to let you a little bit of know about what we do, uh, Black Revolutionary Theater Workshop exists to disrupt any and all oppressive systems that marginalize Black people using narrative and performance at the, at the, as a mythology to recenter Black people and experiences. With economic, social, educational, healthcare, housing, and political injustice facing our community, BRTW aims to tackle the issues that impact us while becoming a beacon for Black opportunity within the arts. Melodated Mondays is our monthly writing and performance saloon, highlighting different themes such as, uh, at, at the intersection of Black justice and civic engagement. This month's theme, as I said, said is housing justice uh, an important important theme the pandemic plunged the states into a massive housing crisis but the infrastructure that's been failing black households has been in place since long before 2020 uh, and some of the pieces tonight will give a great example about how we want to begin to have the conversation uh, beyond the crisis that's currently going on right now uh, tonight we'll have performances uh, uh, from uh, a Green Lining, uh, which is by Heather Harvey, HH. Um, we'll also have If I Got Reparations, written by the lovely Mia Kogavia. And we'll also have a short scene from a full-length play, uh, which uh, is from one of our Revolution Now cohorts. Um, it's called Kave Kanem by A. Emmanuel Leiden. Uh, and We'll have a small community conversation uh, to give a little more uh, feedback from the pieces that we do uh, about housing justice. Um, I want to uh, <laughs> take this time to introduce this lovely, lovely, lovely cast. Uh, uh, I want to start with uh, saying thank you to uh, Donnell Cole Price. Uh, thank you to uh, Melvin Cox uh, and Big thank you to uh, D. Wade, uh, Augustine, uh, Glaive. Is that correct? <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you guys all so much for being here uh, and and using your beautiful talents towards these pieces. Um, the first work that we have up is called Green Lining by H. H. Um, woman and coworker will be played by D. Wade. Man will be played by Donnell. White coworker and homeowner will be played by Melvin Cox, and the voiceover and SD will be played by myself, Tim Craig. Establishing shot. A fragile look looking car pulls up to a traditional Brooklyn brownstone. The car door slams out of the frame, shaking the whole car. Shabby shoes enter the frame and exit. We pan up. A black man, mid thirties, Handsome, but dressed for a long, working, stiff day. Cut to the door. He knocks, holding a clipboard. It opens, revealing an older West Indian woman. Oh, um, we don't want any. The man sticks his foot into the door, preventing her from closing it. EPA, ma'am, your home has been selected for green zoning. You have 30 days to evacuate. He hands her a letter. She doesn't take it. No, I saved for years for this house. It's for my babies and their babies. You can appeal the decision, but the courts are backlogged. By the time you see the inside of a court, you will be in jail for failure to comply. And this place would already be torn down. My advice, take the check. Well, why can't I live in the green zone? You and your home have been reviewed for initial entry. They just want the land. You have to replay. You have to. You have to apply for the lottery like everyone else. 
He thrusts the letter into the open threshold and drops it inside. According to my records, you now receive the notice. Failure to comply within the allotted time period will result in forfeiture of the property. Anything inside your property, remittance. You may also face fines up to 10000 and jail time up to 30 days. Thank you for your cooperation with the federal government. Have a nice day. Woman cries in the threshold. The man descends the stairs and a small group of teens disperse from the front of his car. It has God been damn. vandalized. Goddamn animals. Man inside the car, reviewing a clipboard. He runs to the windshield wipers to wash away the residue left from the eggs on the windshield. Uh, St. Jude Metal shakes as he starts the car and pulls away. Cut to triptych scene. The car pulls up. He walks up to a different door in each panel. Congratulations. You and your home have been selected for inclusion in the green zone. White over George faces fill the two panels. The third panel, featuring a 30-something Black woman, expands to fill the screen. She looks behind her, and a white woman comes forward, smiling, and accepts the envelope. Man looks a little crestfallen. Man cut to man pulling up to an Oster building. Protesters are gathered outside. Cut to man standing in front of the window, looking down at the protesters. Ugh, how many days is this? I've lost count. Leeching off the taxpayers this long. It must hurt to finally stand on their own two feet. You don't ever get it. I mean, we're kicking people out of their homes. The only people who seem to get to stay in the green zone are... Hey, man, I get enough of that snowflake bullshit on the walk to my car. I'm out there on a silver servant's wage, putting calluses on top of my calluses, trying to build green zones to fucking save these animals. I don't have any white guilt to spare here. Huh? Whatever, man. Cut to man walking down a long hallway. Screen fills the walls, showing a beautiful, doomed eco domed eco paradise. Clean, sustainable energy, car free roads, vertical gardens, organic grocery stores, and beautiful man made parks all around your favorite landmarks Columbia University, the Ethical Society. Pacific Park, Socrates Park, all surrounded in a breathable mesh polymer and keeps the clean air in and the pollution out. Introducing NYC's Green Zones. Enter your name in the portfolio in the lottery today for your chance to for a green tomorrow. Cut to morning. Car pulls up in front of, uh, of Queen's home. The car door slams out, out, out of the frame. Shabby shoes walk into the frame. Pan out. Man walks up to the front door. Before he knocks, another black man yanks open the door. He holds a baseball bat. You green police? Brother, I'm just a pencil pusher. I don't but make I, decisions. Hmm. But I bet you were about to decide to give me that letter. Look, man, they're, they're going to give you money. They ain't gonna give me a dime. I just took out another mortgage to cover my daughter's college. You can appeal. Maybe they'll give you another check on down the line. I'm keeping my house, man. Legally, I have to tell you that you have 30 days to evacuate. They can try to take me out my house. Failure to comply within the allowed time period will result in forfeiture of the property. Anything outside and your property remittance. Pay you to comply. I pay your goddamn salary with my taxes. You comply with me. You may also face fines up to $10,000 and jail time up to 30 days. Man, fuck you. Homeowner swings his bat. Man stumbles. He falls down the steps hard. Man scrambles to his feet, attempting to get to his car, leaving the letter behind with a homeowner. Homeowner runs after him, swinging the bat widely. Man catches a brutal swing to the leg. We hear a crack. He screams. 
and the homeowner swings the bat high over his head. The man scrambles for anything near to protect himself. His hands come up empty. Homeowner brings down the bat. Cut to white co-worker standing in front of the window, holding coffee, looking down over the protesters. Another co-worker stops behind him. You hear the news? Not yet. He didn't make it. Raz is talking about arming us, given the climate. No pun intended, right? What? Nothing. Fucking animals. Camera arcs reveals that two of them looking down on the protesters in the green zone are constructed in the distance. End of episode. Oof. That was uh, another rendition of Green Zone by H.H. Um, let's move right along to our next piece of the evening. Uh, this is entitled, If I Got Reparations by Mia Kogava, read by Adiwe Augustine Glaive. If I got reparations, I would want to be a gorget with divine flashing eyes and hair like snakes. What would it feel like to live a life without fear? Would it feel free, easy, like breathing your first clean breath after a chest cold? Like stepping out of a walk-in freezer? Like remembering the haunted house is fake. You know what I want? I want every time someone says shit to me, to be able to set my snake hair to hissing, low and gentle. And instead of feeling small and hollow and scared, I get that cozy feeling of sitting on the couch after drinking coffee, my cat on my lap, purring into me. His lazy eyes blink, blink, blinking. And I want, Every time someone starts shit with my friends to be able to flap my giant wings and disturb the air around me as I fly to them. Fuck your cash. We don't need cash. I'm a motherfucking Gorgon, bitch. <laughs> and then when I reach them, I want to flash my Gorgon eyes and strain my Gorgon lips and smile, my Gorgon smile and turn them all to stone. I want them to have to sit there and listen to each and every moment of pain my ancestors and I had to listen to and not look away. I want each speck of dust to land in their unblinking eyes and make them water and sting. Maybe that will feel like every time I had to freeze my smile in the face of strangers talking about my hair, my skin, my lips, my ass like I was a thing to be weighed and measured. The man who spoke in broken English and called me Maria without knowing my name or my language. The woman who asked me the time of my last pap smear. The man who slipped in close behind me and pressed a cold beer can to the slip of exposed flesh at the small of my back. I wanna force them all to look, to witness, to hurt. Then, and only then, can the real work begin. My goodness, great work. Uh, that was once again, If I Got Reparations by Mia Kogava, read so lovely by Dway Augustine Glaub. Clay, uh, excuse me. Thank you so much. Uh, such a beautiful, beautiful name. <laughs> Thank you. We are going to move forward to uh, the next piece. It's called uh, Cave Canum. It's a stage play by A. Emmanuel Leiden. Uh, the cast will be uh, uh, D-Way playing Cynthia. Jermichael uh, will be played by Donnell. And we'll get right into it. Mm-hmm. So y'all next to each other, huh? I ain't know that. 
He writing to you or something? Hell no. I damn. Last owner was some old man, some formula old man. I'm renting from his people. Glad he doing good. Yeah. He just thriving. He was supremacist. Thought he was your best friend. He became a premises. Should we be worried about Zaire? Should you be worried about you? He voted. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Disappointing. Mm-hmm. But not surprising. He rolled up on his dick both times. Still. I mean, look at him. You can just, I mean, you can tell just by looking at him. I guess. I thought everyone could. He a psych health supremacist or a regular supremacist? What you mean regular? Well, you've seen. None in particular, but. No signs of nothing? Nah, but. If he's just a regular supremacist, leave it alone. Uh, regular supremacist? Yeah. Ain't that some shit? <laughs> see that. See, that's how we get here in the first place, because y'all niggas care about their feelings. At least I voted. I voted in spirit. I physically couldn't leave. Excuses. Shouldn't have waited so damn late. How I know you wasn't going to take your ass on home anyway and do nothing. Like a do nothing bitch ass nigga. Look, I still went up there knowing damn well they weren't going to let me in. Oh, my granddaddy. I was fully intended on checking that white bitch. I mean, woman's name. All I know is I need a job and a roof. And so do you. Unless all millions of us bought a pick up everything and meander around the planet bumming. Oh, Brazil, you gonna use that forest over there? Nah, nah, it's cool. Mongolia, let us hold some of that planes right quick. And niggas like you sitting around trying to philosophize and give out orders, y'all ain't gonna organize that. So we gotta draw them lines. I don't sit around. What you gonna, you done help nigg- Mexicans? You been looking at them like, I mean, do they, they Muslims? Been a little tied up raising a child alone. Ain't been alone through a day of it. Sure ain't alone now. A month old sheet of paper don't make the last 12 years disappear. That bread disappeared on my account, though. You know how many females, I mean, women, wish they had baby daddies that way. All right. Just let me be here. All right. Damn, you want a trophy? Ladies first. Fuck you. It's convenient to act along, ain't it? How about you think about him? I am thinking about him. I'm thinking about every broken promise. Every time I had to get him to quit crying behind you. How about you catch up before you start talking all this shit? Because you heard what she said. I ain't got to keep pressing your goddamn rewind button. If you fumble now, I am out. You just gonna have to try your best when he get grown. That'll be up to him. But me, I will be finished with you. I will end up forgetting the sound of your voice. Understand? Look, girl. Do you understand? Yeah. I understand. You got six days to talk to him. I'm in the middle of it. Because I ain't going to have him out here like your mama had you. When I come get him, he better know everything. Else I'm doing it. Y'all dicks ain't that damn complicated. Ooh, we not that complicated. Uh, again, that was uh, Cave Kano, uh, a stage play by A. Emanuel Leiden, uh, read by D. Way and Donnell. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> I'm always reminded about how much uh, that piece makes me laugh because it is too real, uh, too real. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, again, uh, these pieces were Cave Kano. Uh, by A. Manuel Leiden, uh, If I Got Reparations by Mia Gogavia, uh, and also, uh, but not least, Green Line by uh, Heather Harvey. Uh, three wonderful pieces around our Melanated Mondays uh, theme of housing justice. Um, uh, at this moment, uh, we're gonna take a small break and come back at you with our community discussion. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. See you very soon. Uh, hello, hello, and uh, welcome back to uh, this month, November, 
uh, is Melanated Mondays, uh, centered around housing justice. Uh, now, this time, uh, usually we at BRTW, uh, we have a speaker uh, that comes on and shares their expertise uh, about their field, uh, working in uh, one of the themes that we have uh, created. Um, today, we're going to have a more intimate conversation between these lovely artists that you just saw featured in these works uh, and, and myself. Um, so I guess the best way I can do to get this started is on a personal note. Uh, uh, housing justice is so important uh, in our community um, in so many ways. Uh, and, and we're gonna try to get onto some of them uh, today. Uh, as you know, it's the end of November. Uh, so it's a season where we're all kind of coming together uh, with our families. Um, uh, some of us are, some of us not. Uh, some of us don't even have the uh, opportunity to do so. Uh, so in that regard, uh, it's a really great opportunity to kind of talk about um, how we can improve uh, the conditions of our fellow uh, 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 people that are, are underhoused, uh, not even the people that are simply underhoused, but the people that can't even get a voucher to an apartment to the people that can't even get a, a, a realtor to take them seriously because of a voucher. Uh, the people that are simply looking to change up their uh, uh, their housing situation uh, to a different point to, 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 to a different point of view. Maybe it's a single mother looking for maybe it's looking to mortgage in uh, you know a, a different kind of neighborhood. There are so many levels to housing and I just kind of want to be able to open it up uh, today. Uh, the first thing I want to ask, I want to talk about um, and, and, and reflect with uh, these lovely artists is uh, how can we approach centering community uh, in the context of housing? Uh, that's a really, really good question. Something that comes to mind for me on this issue is like, regarding the houseless people in our communities as our neighbors and not as people who are like impeding on our way of life, but people who are a part of our community and making sure that they know that we see them and that we recognize them as um, members of our society and not just like a burden. And I think using the word neighbor can kind of shift that understanding of houselessness a lot. And I think that's something that has helped me in my like psychology to shift how I view houselessness in communities that not only are where I live, but like where I work and the communities that I serve. That's so eloquently yep. put, D-Way. Thank you so much. To continue to think about uh, uh, people who are underhoused as neighbors. Um, uh, I think that's such a, a really relevant point because I feel like so often that we, we, we a lot of people are, are so easy to write them off. Uh, and that is a lot of institutional kind of sensibility, a lot of institutional conditioning. Uh, and I, I think uh, that's such a valid point to continue to be reminded that they are neighbors in our community, cor corresponding to where you live and corresponding to where you work. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, that was good, d -Way. And um, also, um, like, I think in these, like she said, especially in our communities as well, it's set up, you know, it's set up so that we, so that lower income housing, they can't get housing. You know what I'm saying? It's set up so that we can't get it anyways. So I think in order for things to truly, truly change, we ha it has to be uprooted at the tree trunk, you know, the roots. Because it's, I, f I still too feel as well, it's, it's, you know, systematic racism is still, you know, it's, there's still things that's going on that are preventing this from housing for, ha for you know, for happening. Um, so I think setting up banks, setting up something where, you know, there's, there's like some kind of form of banks in, in, in our communities where they really know, like she said, neighbors, 
you know, how can we like bring something into to, to fruition to show them like, listen, y'all are not forgotten. You know what I'm saying? Like we are here. We are, we're, 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 we're trying to help you guys as well. Cause I just feel like there's so much that can be done. There are so many abandoned building buildings. And I think they're in areas that are low, um, they're low, they're, they're in places where you can build lower income housing, if that makes sense. They're in places that you can build lower income housing. So it's like, why is it not being, why is it not happening? Like, why is it not happening? Yeah. So it's figuring out how to, you know, bring it to light fully, you know, for us. Because I know as artists, we've all had um, situations where we've not had housing or we've been close to like, oh, no, what's going to happen? You know, what I'm saying? we've been in cases where, you know, you can empathize and sympathize and understand like it is like, you know, it's a really serious matter. And it's, nothing's happening really. So, I, yeah. Thank you so much, Melvin. Uh, mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. I think in a certain regard, we can all relate. It doesn't always have to be people who are under house to relate to not being able to be housed, not being able to find, you know, <laughs> what you are looking for. And that kind of yeah. goes different um, in income brackets and levels. Um, I think one of the things that I think my, my roommate and we were kind of talking earlier, uh, and that is true, is that in, in, in this country right now, there is more housing available for the underhouse. <laughs> uh, it make it make sense, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. New York City also there is how empty housing, empty yeah. buildings. Whether it's from like lottery, there are empty, uh, you know, rent, 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 uh, renovated buildings that are completely empty. Uh, I think I don't want to, I don't want to misquote, but I, no, I think the number was around. Uh, a 30, 30 to forty percent of just empty uh, buildings, apartments or, along the tri-state area here in New York City. Yep. Um, that that is always alarming to me. Uh, in addition, uh, for with that fact and it being, and I think this is one of our, my next questions or one of my next kind of uh, points. Um, uh, our elected officials kind of talk so little about uh, the housing issue. Uh, and, and a lot of regards. So there was like a, there was just a midterm that would come up, and you know we we never I, I haven't personally. I'm not going to speak on never. I don't really hear much about how this issue impacts us, and it, it impacts us in our community uh, detrimentally, and, and a lot more than than others, um, uh, as you said, Melvin. Uh, so I think in regard to like knowing that there is so much capacity versus so little representation. Uh, what is something that we can do to change that? How can we create more of a grassroots movement uh, and getting people, uh, Black people, um, in positions to make more choices about how we're housing each other and how we're helping each other? Um, because we're not in those, we're not always in those city council meetings. We're not always in that mayor's office. Um, but how can we all get back into there? Because a lot of the regard is, is thought of as an afterthought. You know, I can't tell you uh, I can't tell you how many people I know with vouchers that literally are able to get funding and for a place of living, uh, and it is owed to them. Uh, and how uh, lit how much people in the real estate industry will write it off and look to the next person when they're yeah. a completely eligible person who is making mm. uh, forward progress in their life, um, and not even thought of, literally discarded. Uh, so with those three points, I want to open up to you, uh, you know, how can we be a part of that decision-making from a grassroots point of view? How can we be more active in that, uh, in that regard? Okay, um, I wanted to make some statements based off kind of the first questions. So I'll kind of be picking back and off of what everybody said earlier, plus the question itself. But um, I felt like, like she said earlier about like community, I feel like all walks of life should like kind of play their part into making sure that they show up to these community meetings, they voice their opinions, you know what I mean? Like if you could make it to one of them, like at least get as much of the proper information as you can. I feel like sometimes people like mess up a lot of programs and systems that have been placed because they got like the wrong information. They didn't actually talk to the right people. 
you know, they kind of did things at the last minute and then they talk bad about government, but people don't tell you the full story. Like, oh yeah, I didn't actually go to the meeting. I heard about it from this lady at church and the information might not even actually been correct. So it kind of makes people show up with an attitude. <laughs> and, and, you know, it can make certain programs and systems a little bit more difficult because people just got wrong information. I mean, and at that point, you can understand where the frustrations are coming in at. It's already limited access and limited funding, limited time, et cetera. They don't really want to do it anyway. And then uh, another statement I wanted to make, you're right, Tim, our politicians don't make uh, and speak towards these things as often. You know why? It's because they benefit a lot from the amount of money that they get from the permitting from the people who do build market rate projects. Mm -hmm. They need that oh, permitting money to come in on a regular basis. So they're not going to mm -hmm. stop it. Nope. They're not. <laughs> they're not. Uh, and you know, that's such an uh, important point, uh, important point as directly connected to a lot of the people that we uh, elect. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think it's, it's such an incredible shame, Donnell, because we should be, or we, we say that we value housing as a human right. Uh, so it should be just as important as uh, healthcare or whatever. But as we know, since slavery, it's never been important for us for black and brown people. They need, I'm like, they need to reform zonings to have mixed incomes in communities mm -hmm. that, that, that allow for the, for our people to thrive in these communities. You know what I'm saying? I feel like too, sometimes they place these, these housings and in, in places where they can't thrive anyway. You know, we're we're out there. Are, we're already cut away from resources. Like, okay, so you're planted here. So how can they get to sustain where they are already? Put them in, put the housings in communities, and lower that income where they can thrive. You know what I'm saying? Where we can thrive. And I think that's one of the. For me, I've always thought about that. Like, why they just won't reform the zoning? You know, fix zoning, change it up, fix it up, so you can allow people to be in these places and survive. It's like they don't want you to survive. They don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a really great point, Melvin. Uh, the zoning and having mixed mixed incomes in, in that regard, uh, having mm -hmm. more access, and, and that will be allow for having more access. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that point. Um, yeah, man. Uh, like for all, opportunities. Like, yes. Yeah. Uh, there are, are opportunities. Um, you know, I, I I have conversations with people <laughs> uh, that have, you know, is, what do you want to call it, Lori? Come, what have you? It's people that 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 do rely on uh, governmental systems, and some and 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 sometimes, you know, those governmental systems do fail, uh, and they make it a, a, a bit of a maze. You know, I think I was having a conversation with a woman the other day, uh, where she was trying to get. You know, she was trying to get her food stamps, uh, her name and her food stamps, just to go to, <laughs> just to make sure that she had the, per the the identification to be able to go to her um, her shelter at the end of the day, because she had to be there by six o'clock with this identification that had her food stamp card, um, or she wouldn't she wouldn't be able to get in. She was like explaining to me the process. Uh, and I have a lot of privilege. I'm going to be uh, the first to say that, you know, and one of those privileges is, is a roof over my head. And mm -hmm. being, talking to this woman reminded me of how many hoops you have to jump through just to have a roof over your head. Yeah. And I know that th th this is one woman's experience, but it, it, it was enlightening to me because, you know, it's like in order to have this this service you needed to go get this other service and wait in line for this other service to be able to be approved for it quote unquote mm -hmm. um, and so i was just thinking if it's that hard to, to to even get that roof over your head you know how many people are doing it and then you can get i can see how people get to a point where they just like excuse my language mm -hmm. like you know like yep. they over it yeah yeah they lose. give up honestly yeah and they nothing. give up in that in that decision making is something that's very particular, particular to how we should kind of look into this because as Melvin said earlier, it's not always people who just we 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 see people on the street and we interact with them as if there is nothing to be done. But a lot of the decision making has already been made for them. 
Um, and so it's not like people want to be underhoused. <laughs> it's just the access, <laughs> the care, and, 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 and the patience uh, hasn't always been there. And so we can create incremental systems that help people get towards their objective uh, that would be uh, more ideal, I yeah, feel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, creating those opportunities. Yeah. A, a lot of broken trust. <clears throat> of course. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of broken trust because I, I would imagine that this particular woman, she'd have to do that next, the same thing that, that, that next day to make sure that she's identified as somebody who has access to, to housing. And that's good too. We need more works like, like these that we are reading, you know what I'm saying? So it's just putting putting the honest truth in the work as well as artists, you know, when we're creating. Uh, we have to do more creating for us and speaking the truth. Because there's a there's a, a lane for for us in truth about our about the black and brown experience. So yes, I mean speaking of which, you know, not to not to, to, to go off of what you just said, Melvin, Heather, Heather written, wrote Green Lining and it's yeah. so place. So it's 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 speaking about a housing issue mm -hmm. uh, and a climate issue. Uh, and so there's so many variations of things that to, to be able to, to deal with. There are people in Green Lining um, who have homes and yeah, are just get, being, yeah. being kicked out because they have lived in certain neighborhoods um, all of their lives. And we see that happening all over the country. You know, here here in Brooklyn, San Francisco, California, uh, we see bit by bit of that uh, happening all the time. Uh, so how it is, uh, how a housing issue is impacting a climate issue in our community is also an important conversation that yeah. we need to continue to have. Definitely. And, uh, you guys have worked so beautifully to help us be able to kind of understand that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I just wanted to throw something else out there. I noticed you mentioned a lot of like the bigger cities in terms of like the housing, um, I guess how expensive it is and like the shortage, but I feel like, you know how America's kind of shifted to this like urban draw versus suburban when we were growing up in like the 80s and the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, every major town or metropolitan with a half a million people, now they got lofts downtown and cafes. So that's yeah. the thing. So what I'm really trying to say is, is like that whole like urban s artist housing overpriced shortage is almost happening everywhere. 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 And including the college towns, which are typically small places, but you guys know how like luxury college towns can be. You oh, know, yeah. Real nice. So I'd say between the combination of like the small college towns, which, you know, those universities typically have a nice, a lot of money and then just just C and D markets, they have that section of town that you want to be in. And it's just pricey. It's comparable to like big cities. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Something I've noticed here in Cleveland. Oh, you're in Cleveland. Oh, yeah. Cleveland's a perfect example of that. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's just, it's inescapable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, I was thinking too, you know, we walk these, like, I'm in New York, and, like, you know, you see people on the streets, black and brown people on the street on a daily. And, you know, I always think about, too, like, man, these people, we have no idea about these people's lives. Like, these people, some of these people, I'm sure, had it all, too, had nice homes, this and that, and something something happened. And then what transpired, what happened? You know, it could have been housing or something like that. I'm giving an example of, like, the same people on the street, this has happened to them. You know, they've, they've, they've experienced this and they've given up. And it's given so up. easy. Yeah, they've given up. And it's so easy to, to, to pass and then, you know, to not look. But I think it's like what you said, Tim, when you were talking, she, it made you just feel more grateful. Like, it made you understand, too, when you were talking to the lady. Like, wow, like, I'm thankful I got her. I have a roof over my head because... So it's just being grateful too. I think being grateful too produces great work, yes, of course, absolutely. and great ideas. So I think being grateful for what we have, you know, I'm trying to give back. Well, wouldn't you guys agree? Like it's probably impactful the fact that Tim just listened to what she was coming from. You know what I mean? Tim. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. a person who's, who's not, he's more of an outsider and just, I'm sure she probably have opportunities to complain. I don't want to say complain or share those frustrations with people that are like probably going through that as well. But 
just him like being like I'm a whole different whatever going on, but I can like listen to where you're coming from, man. Being aware, yeah. Being yeah. Aware. yeah. And if we are operating like with the idea that like these people have been fighting and at some point after like being hurt and disregarded so many times eventually gave up, there's no telling what a show of like empathy and compassion like that can exactly. inspire them to like fight again. Mm. Exactly. I think, I think one, of, one of the things I observed about her is her commitment. It's like, oh, this is a, like, my commitment is trying to get a Zoom open. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> facts. Her, yeah. her, <laughs> her, her, it's true. Her commitment to a home every day was something I think that it was a drive. It was a real drive. And I think that that was something I, 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 I observed from her and I respected from her. Uh, was that it was something that she had to do. It, it's, it's like a daily. Yes. And so I was reminded about daily routine of practice every day when um, we can create practices if we are, you know, the country that we're saying that we should be. Um, there is something that we can do to create that to not have to be her drive every day to like create that forward motion. Um, but yes. I do know that, you know, people are fighting for those vouchers. People are fighting for that, that assistance. Um, which leads me to the, like the next question, you know, maybe maybe to, to kind of close it out. On a big level and on also a small level, uh, what what can we do individually uh, to help this crisis? You know, I want to be able, I want to call it a crisis because that's what it is. Uh, what can we do individually, and what can we do as a larger group of people? Well, to, to leave our viewers with something that is uh, hopeful, to leave our viewers with something that is doable and actionable. I think for me, um, something that resonated with me is what D-Way said, and just like a simple perspective change of making sure that we see these people as neighbors uh, and, and not not some, not some an other, you know, we, we yes. tend to other. Um, I'll give an example, you know, I, not, to, not to digress too much, but I think I was in the park at a food pantry on Wednesday uh, and it's like very public, you know, it's just like in a park and it, anybody can come get, get, get some food. Um, they had, you know, really great food out there. Um, but we also noticed people like walking by who may have been of more privileged, like their utter disgust of like what is going on. And like, they're, they're, they're looking down upon, you know, the people that are, you know, and it's like literally giving foods to people who are hungry. So people can survive yeah um and so that's why what d -Way said to me really resonated because there is such an active um opposition to us to a different lifestyle and so we yes. can continue to make sure that we understand that these are our brothers and our sisters and our neighbors um that is something that is very actionable to me and with that perspective shift, we can we can make certain changes, whether it's a you know a conversation, or or a helping out. You know, uh, that's yeah. that's one for me. Uh, what about you guys? I think for me, um, I I think you know you do what you can. You do what you know you're supposed to do first off. Like if you know it's time for elections and things of, of that nature. You need to be researching, knowing who's over such and such that's connected to what's affecting your heart and pulling at your heartstrings to make a difference. So if these people are over it, they're not doing their job, you got to vote. You have to vote. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, I know we don't want to vote, <laughs> but we have to. I think as, as, as Black and brown people anyway, as a Black community, we have to vote. Especially you know. in our local elections. Yes, local. Where we can yes, affect yes. like city council members and judges who are sentencing yes. people and like deciding mm. how like districts are drawn and stuff like that. Like, So I think they need to be promoted more. If we can like figure out, and that leads me to my next um, little idea as a community come together, how we, where we can even promote local elections more because people just be clueless and oblivious truly they don't even be they don't be knowing it's not that they just don't be checking it's just there's nothing to show like you need to be voting for local elections a lot of people don't watch tv and stuff so it's just yeah. i think we can figure out something to bring awareness in that aspect uh, good yeah 
Great point. And I'm going to take that one a next step forward. These nonprofits, the people mm. who run these nonprofits, I've noticed since I was a kid, like I've lived in multiple cities, you know, over the years. Um, but I always take that moment, just kind of sit down and be like, who are they? who's the mayor in this little place? You know what I mean? Sometimes you just got to find out. But yeah. I've noticed that these nonprofits, it's the same old people going from, you know, either they move up in their organization or they move to a one that's similar or they go take over one that's, you did a good, mm. good job at that one like yeah. food pantry organization that budgets is millions of dollars a year and they'll just switch shift over to something else maybe with healthcare with a million dollars a year and they kind of wasn't really doing much at the last place either it's the same old folks mm -hmm. yeah like a, a circle very well yep. what it, get them out of there what are you <laughs> yeah. and you're absolutely right that's a that's a really incredible point because mm -hmm. if the missions of these nonprofits uh is a certain way it just kind of becomes a game that goes back and forth. That's a really yeah. Uh, uh, dynamic. Yeah, for real. I feel like there's a lot of nonprofits that are like so that claim and will have on their website on their mission, like we want to serve this community, and it's like we want to make sure we give these people resources or whatever. But it's like, where is the money? Thank you. Where is the money? You can all this money see, and you don't do nothing. I see the budget. Or right. I see, yeah, I see in, the, in the hiring or something like that. I yeah. see the numbers. <laughs> I feel I feel like privileged to work for I work for a nonprofit theater, Cleveland Public Theater is a nonprofit, and I teach in public housing. I teach theater to kids. And okay. so and the chance that this is being seen by any Cleveland people, if you are theater artists and you have any experience or desire to teach, we are hiring for substitute teachers. And Us that would too. be an amazing opportunity because I think theater is an amazing and beautiful way to get communities connected. What? and to bridge gaps a lifesaver a lifesaver mm -hmm. mm -hmm. a beacon really of hope <laughs> yeah yes uh, I that is really really incredible um really really good points yeah um, go cleveland hey, yes cleveland um <laughs> if you guys have uh, uh any other Further comments, uh, understandings, reflections, anything that, that resonates um, with these lovely pieces that we read tonight, or just something that you want to uh, share as we we head out um, uh, towards, uh, you know, understanding uh, uh, the 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 housing crisis as it is right now and how how we can lift up. But um, you know, no man. And Joji wants. I feel you. In the world. Thank you so much, D Way. Thank you so much, Melvin. Yeah, thank you. Thank, so you. thank you so much, Cure, for being a uh, part of this conversation. Um, we hope it has uh, it has certainly helped me. We hope it is has helped you. Um, you know, think about uh, how we can approach this differently. Um, some of these these pieces have helped certainly helped me, uh, and I also too. hope they help you. Um, I want to say thank you to all of our view viewers. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Heather Harvey and Mia Kogavia, uh, yes. the co-artistic producers of BRTW. Uh, I want to say thank you to our lovely performers tonight. Uh, without you, this is literally not possible. <laughs> uh, I want to say thank you so much to Kira Kudris, who is our line producer right now, helping us out on the, uh, on the technical uh, part of things. Thank you so much, Kira. Uh, BRTW, honestly. At, B, at the brtw.org. Uh, you can donate, find out more about our programs. Um, we have Melanated Mondays. It's every third Monday. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We have a lovely a podcast with uh, our Revolution Now writers that are so incredibly talented. And we've been doing it for a minute now that all of these writers have gone on to bigger and better things, spreading their wings. Uh, we uh, have a variety of programs. Uh, if you're looking to intern with us, uh, produce with us, uh, please hit our website, uh, thebrtw.org, find out more information. Uh, again, if you'd like to donate, uh, this is all free programming that we offer. Uh, you can also hit that same uh, website. Um, you can find us streaming uh, at uh, thebrtw uh, on the facebook.com. Uh, so you can find us there. We thank you, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Uh, and we will see you in December where we feature our Revolution Now cohort for next year. Um, a lovely, no, another lovely group of writers um, that are gonna be the future of uh, uh, American theater. 
Uh, again, thank you guys so much for your time. And you guys uh, have a lovely evening.